Good afternoon. Uh, today's sermon passage is from Psalm 1, beginning in verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. All right. Okay. Well, I want to welcome everybody again. Uh, my name is Buck Rogers. I am the pastor here. And uh, if any of you, this is really hot, okay. If any of you came in late and are visiting with us today, I want to welcome you. I'm so glad that you've come here. Uh, on the back of our bulletin, there's a QR code. And I want to encourage you, if you're visiting with us, to scan that with your phone. Uh, you can do it now. You can do it before you leave. And it's like four questions that will let us know more about you so that we can tell you more about our gatherings and the like. And also so I can send you a personal note. I'd love to do that. So please fill that out if you get a chance to. Um, also, I want to remind you, if you came in uh, after the announcements next week, we will not be meeting here uh, in the morning. We, we will be meeting actually at the Venue of Friendship Springs at 1030, our new spot, our new time. Uh, you can feel free to go to our website. It'll have more information about what that looks like. Um, uh, so uh, that being said, um, our church is a place where we are uh, always trying to get people to connect with God. Uh, we just finished a sermon series on prayer, and this summer we are going to have a sermon series on the Psalms, uh, which are uh, 150 Hebrew poems that are situated, if you had a Bible and opened it up, right about in the center. Uh, the name Psalms uh, is translated uh, praises or songs um, because they were meant to be a hymn book for God's people in the Old Testament as they worshipped. That's what it was used for. Um, they're written in a poetic style, and it doesn't, it seems odd, it doesn't seem like a poem the way we think about poems because it doesn't rhyme. But if you look at the Psalms as they're written, they're often written in these either two or three lines that are parallel with each other. They either say the same thing or um, where they reemphasize verses before or after. And they're written in that poetic style uh, so that in the Hebrew mind, something happens when they read them that is like when you read a poem that rhymes, or probably more so like when you sing a song that resonates with you, all right? So the same thing that happens when we hear songs and the words sort of sink in, uh, it, it also happens when they were reading these particular uh, poems in the Old Testament called the Psalms. And this artistic way of writing is meant to help people sort of get what God says, theology, into their bones. You know, like a song does that for you, right? It makes words that are normal every day, household words, that have deep meaning, profound meaning when you sing them. Uh, so that's sort of what's happening in the Psalms. Um, it's meant to move us from oftentimes right thinking. We usually think really well about the Bible toward right practice. They're meant to move us out from just being people who think about God and what he does to actually people who express things about God, particularly in the way that we sing or the way that we worship. Um, they have this unique ability uh, to move our beliefs from our heads to our hearts out to our hands in the way that we serve people. Uh, the Psalms are pretty fantastic. Um, and in most uh, Christian history, there's always some sort of regular going back to the Psalms, whether it be in readings or in worship over and over again. So um, it, 
I'm hoping that over the course of the summer, the Psalms will become something that you will treasure and that you will really love as we study them. One more important thing that I want to mention to you about the Psalms before we jump into Psalm 1 um, is to remember that Psalms also create what I'm going to call good tensions for us in our lives, okay? In other words, we tend to want to run one way or run another, and Psalms keep us in a really good tension. I'm going to give you an example of one. Um, Worship is a good example. Um, We can either think about worship as primarily being a time for us to express ourselves to God, right? To sing or to pray. We're expressing what's going on inside of us out to him. But worship also in, in the Psalms we see over and over again is a way that God is shaping and forming us through rhythms, through uh, almost a Hebrew rhyme, we begin to be changed over by worship. And so there's this tension between worship being something where I'm expressing myself, but also worship being a time where I'm being formed and shaped by God at the same time. So that's just an example of one. I'm going to give you more as we keep walking through them. But for today, we want to jump into Psalm 1. And before we do, I'd like to pray and ask God that uh, he would open up our, not only minds, that we understand this psalm better before we leave, but once again, it would get down into our bones, into our hearts, and out into our hands in the way that we live. I think this psalm in particular is going to have that effect. Um, So let me pray and ask God to bless us as we hear his word. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that you would uh, give us mercy as we think about Psalm 1. And we ask uh, that the words of this psalmist would resonate with us and help us to think about our own lives right now. So we pause and we give everything and everyone to you. And we give ourselves to you and ask that you would do what you will as we hear from your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a friend in college, I've shared some with this with some of you before, uh, who used to talk about the Christian life uh, like a sponge. He would say that uh, Christians are like people, really all people work this way, not just Christians, but that we, we're always soaking stuff up. You know, uh, you get in your car, you turn on the radio, you're soaking something up. You go to school and you learn from your teachers, you soak things up. You go to work and you practice and do this job, you're soaking things up. They were always soaking things up in our lives. They're coming in, right? And then there comes a point in your life, usually when you suffer and you get squeezed. And what you've been soaking up is what inevitably comes out. I think that's a very helpful analogy for thinking about a psalm, particularly like Psalm 1. This sponge theology helps us think about the lessons that this psalmist is trying to teach us. Psalm 1 is teaching that there is a really basic truth. There are two ways you can live your life, okay? One way is with God, and one way is without God. Those are the two ways you can live your life. And those two ways have pretty dramatic ways that they are soaking up things from the world. They have pretty dramatic ways that when they're squeezed that things come out. And they have pretty dramatic consequences in the end if you live in those particular ways. So what I want to do is to uh, take a little closer look at them today, to think a little bit about them, by thinking about, first of all, how do these two ways of life, with God or without God, soak up? uh, How do do they bring about influence into our life? Let's look at them. Uh, So the first two verses of this psalm, I'm going to flip this over so I can see it, Um, It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, stand in the way the sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Now, a couple of things about this. He's talking about people at this point who who live without God. He uses the words wicked, the sinners, the mockers. Uh, Those three words are sort of a progression. They're describing different approaches to uh, thinking about God. The wicked are people who are generally evil and prideful and selfish. Sinners are people who have missed the mark and are not living the way God has called them to live. Mockers are people who are antagonistic toward God and just flat out deny or oppose him. All of these words summarize this way of living uh, without God. 
uh, a way of living where God is optional in your life. A way of living where maybe there's even antagonism or opposition toward God in your life. But look a little closer at, at how he describes these three, okay, this, this way of living. He says, um, who do not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. You notice this, he goes walking to standing to sitting, all right? Now, what this is doing is it's describing a progression or a way that we are influenced, Okay? If you imagine just walking down the street and you run into somebody, you might have a quick conversation, but then you keep going. Very little influence. <clears throat> but if you're standing with someone and having a conversation for a while, lots of influence. You sit down with somebody at a table, more influence. It's this progression of how much influence people are having in your life. And it's basically describing what it means uh, for you to be shaped by influences. Or another word we like to use is the way that you are discipled. Discipleship just means that you're following something in your life. And all of us in the room, whether we're Christians or not Christians, are following things. We're being influenced by them all the time. And so the big question that we have to answer as we think a little bit about what it means uh, to, to soak things up is what is influencing you? What is discipling you? What are you following in your life? All right, now what I'm about to talk about may make you frustrated, all right? But, but I want to say that, like, none of you are probably going to be more frustrated than me. I am preaching to the choir right now, and this is difficult as we talk about influence. Here are some things to think about in terms of influencing your life. Are you influenced by the media or by news? Consumers spend an average of seven hours a day engaged on media. That's a worldwide stat. Seven hours a day, people are engaged in some sort of way with the media. Um, social media, in particular, is designed specifically to, to get your attention and to distract you from other things so that you will sink into sort of this online world instead of engaging in the outside world. And the reason they do that is because it's profitable for people to be able to use you in that inside world. It leads to you buying things. It leads to people making money. And so the average American spends 705 hours a year on social media. That's 30 days. 30 days of your year, of the average American year, is spent on social media. Entertainment, like Netflix, television, sports, YouTube, the average American, this is wild, are you ready? Spends 2,737 hours a year on some sort of entertainment, in, involved in some sort of entertainment. That is 114 days you're spending watching television. Uh, the average male, <laughs> this is even scarier. Sorry, guys. Sorry, kids. Uh, the average male spends 10,000 hours playing video games before they turn 21 years old. Ten th that's 416 days. That's a year and a third of your life before you turn 21 just on video games. Let's talk about your phone, okay? Whew, this is where it gets. Uh, um, the average iPhone user uh, touches their phone 2,617 times a day. A day, all right? And they average... 3.5 hours of use on the phone a day. Now, I think that's skewed. I think that's, uh, I'm not so sure that's, I think it's an old stat, the 3.5. You should, if you have an iPhone, you get like an update of your screen time, usually of which we shamefully just don't look at, right? Because we don't want to know. Um, but here's the thing, okay? Like all of that input, all of that influence on you takes a toll. Listen to some of these quotes by some people that I think are helpful about this. Uh, James Williams says this. He says that the tech industry is the largest, most standardized, and most centralized form of attention control in human history. Attention control. Tony Schwartz, a writer for the New York Times, says that addiction, addiction 
defined is defined as the relentless pull to a substance or an activity that becomes so compulsive that it ultimately interferes with your everyday life. By that definition, nearly everyone we know is addicted to the internet. Everyone. What does this mean for us? Well, it means this. We are being discipled by our phones. We are being discipled by the internet. We are being discipled by news stations. And we are allowing far more of that sort of influence walking, standing, sitting with these influences into our life uh, than we can handle as human beings. Um, compare these numbers to the amount of time you spend with your family, with your spouse, or let's get down to it, that you spend with God. Who has the influence in your life? Who is discipling you? That's what the psalmist is getting at here in the beginning. What are you soaking up? Um, there's, speaking of media consumption, um, there's, a, there's a television show called Modern Family, and there's an episode of Modern, if you haven't seen Modern Family, there's an episode, it's about this really, three just really weird dysfunctional families, but one of them has this typical teenage girl named Haley, and Haley is just kind of your ditzy, always involved with their friends, uh, so on and so forth, but there's an episode that's very funny where Haley get, loses her phone, okay? And she loses it for the, almost the entire episode. And this is what happens to her over the course of the episode. She starts, first of all, she's outside and she starts noticing nature. <laughs> she's never really thought about it before, you know. She's seeing things as beautiful and is actually talking about it to people. And then she starts reading books. She likes one part of the show where she's like, I, I've never read one of these things before. This is kind of incredible. This is such a great story. She talks about reading a book. Um, she becomes emotionally stable. Like she's not frantic. She's like very easy to talk to and soft-spoken. Um, she engages in relationships with people in her family and is actually concerned about them, whereas usually she's not concerned about them at all. She's becoming increasingly self-aware and, um, and apologizes a lot, right? And like every time this keeps happening, her parents are just dumbfounded. They're like, what is happening to you, right? And, uh, and then at the end of the show, she gets another phone and goes right back into the world. of living the way she did before. <laughs> um, and it's such, a, it's such a, a credible picture of how when influence is taken away, we become different people, right? We're changed when that influence is taken away. Um, so... Uh, my goal, obviously, here is, is not just to make you stop using your phones, but to think about what you're soaking up. And, of course, he says there, there are right things to soak up in this passage. Uh, he uses the word in the beginning, blessed is the one who doesn't do these things, right? Blessed describes God's favor on those who resist the influence of those who live without God. It describes a life to, of, of listeners. Blessed are people who don't live this way. And the description is blessed are these people because they're free. Because they're really free. They're not um, encumbered by this uh, desire to satiate themselves with this influence. Um, they're free to live under God's favor rather than laboring to earn favor from other people or to live some sort of life in order to keep things that they love or to make them feel comfortable. It says in the passage that these type of people are delighted in God's law. It says in verse 2, but those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditate on his law day and night, those, th that is what true life is really like. Uh, God's law in this passage, I know it's easy for us to read that and think rules, right? Uh, Ten commandments, right? But what we forget about is why those things are actually so good for us. The word of God is meant to show us how to live uh, rightly. It's like, a, it's like the, if the designer of the human being wrote a book on what it looked like to live out that design, that is what God's law does. It's meant to instruct us how to live life uh, fruitfully, to live life um, uh, fervently, to live it well in all these ways. Um, um, 
people ask, people have asked us before, and this is one thing I really like to convey because it involves our church. Um, what's the easiest way to summarize the gospel? The good news. And I say there are three words that summarize the gospel best. Jesus is king. That's why our church is called Christ the King, by the way. Because we believe the best news that we can tell the world is that Jesus is the king. Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, so it says in Matthew. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if the best news in our lives is that Jesus is the king and that living the way he says we should live our lives is truly good and beautiful and wonderful and flourishing for us as people, uh, that we're being shaped into real true flourishing human beings while living under him, that is what we want to try to convey. And that's what he's trying to say when he says that people delight in God's law. He's saying that we delight in this because it is uh, the right thing for us to be soaking up. So the picture painted in verse 2 is the effect of Jesus' work. He came to rescue us from our sin and misery that we might live out our design in his kingdom. And this transforms the way we think about the law of God from sort of rules to keep Instead, to um, ways to flourish, ways to really be what we're meant to be. So here's something to think about as we move on from this. What are you soaking up? He says, uh, blessed are those who meditate on this law day and night. That word meditate means to ponder or to like mutter it to yourself, to talk, you know, like when you're in the shower and you just talk to yourself, you know what I'm talking about? You're saying things that you want to hear. Uh, this is saying the gospel to yourself. What would it look like for you to meditate, to ponder, to mutter on God's law more in your life? Uh, what would a shift like that do to your relationships, to the way you work, to the way you relate to your family? What would, what would living in delight in that way do? So that's the first part, um, soaking. The second way that we think about these two uh, these two dynamics of life uh, is squeezing. Uh, I want to look at two metaphors of fruitfulness that we see in verses 3 and 4. The first is, uh, I want to I skip to the end of those that live without God. What is life like for them? What happens when they get squeezed after they have soaked up uh, life without God? It says in verse 4 that the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. All right, now what does that mean? Um, those that are influenced and embrace opposition to God are like chaff. Okay, so chaff, if you want to imagine wheat, for example, that's being harvested. Um, there are two parts to the wheat. There's the, the, the hard, grainy part that's used to make bread. And then there's this husk on the outside of it that's light, wispy. Uh, it's almost translucent, you see it. And what people will do is they will take... Um, the, the wheat, and they will, they will stir it up, and they'll throw it in the air, and the hard parts will fall back down into the pan that they're using, and the wind will blow away this light husk called chaff, all right? So that's the picture. You're, 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 you're sifting the wheat, and the, the wheat falls back down. You, the hard parts fall. The chaff blows away in the wind. That's the idea, and he's using this metaphor to describe what people are like who live their lives in vain who live their lives just kind of being influenced uh, by those who are without God. Um, <clears throat> the chaff are the parts that are lifeless, worthless, unusable, empty. And when he says the wind blows them away, this is an allusion to the vanity of life without God. Um, like a life of grasping things that vanish. You know how this feels. You know, you pursue things like, oh, if I just get this job, my life will change forever. And you get the job. Things are different, but life is still hard, you know? Oh, if I just date this person, my life will change forever. You know, we put all our hope in these things, and they just, the wind blows them away like chaff. Um, living for brief momentary pleasure or comfort, an inner emptiness that leaves us feeling hollow, um, this is what this emptiness or vanity feels like. It's like the, you know, the story of Tom Brady, who's married to a supermodel and won all these Super Bowls, and he's interviewed. And in the interview, Brady says, there has to be more than life than this. He, he feels the vanity, right? He feels it. 
of life without God. But with God, the metaphor changes. Look at what it says in verse uh, 3. The person that is with God is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Um, The image is of a tree who's planted by a river, and it's this dry area. It's an arid area, but there's a river flowing through it, and the tree is planted by this river, and it bears fruit. I have a neighbor. uh, Well, I had a neighbor where I used to live. When we moved in, we noticed in the backyard of this guy's house, there was this just enormous tree. It was probably 20, 30 feet taller than its house, big, beautiful leaves each year. It was a weird tree. I'm still not exactly what kind it was. And I went over and talked to my neighbor, Jerry, and I was like, dude, tell me about this tree. Was this, has this been here for a long time? And he goes, oh no, I planted it six years ago. It's 20, 30 feet taller than his house. And I'm like, what? And uh, he's like, yeah, yeah, the weirdest thing, man. We planted this tree. It grew a little bit. And then my septic tank burst right next to it. And for the next three years, it just grew out of control. And it's just always been this giant tree, right? And that's sort of the idea that, like, uh, you know, it, how much more then if you plant a tree by living water, right? Or you plant you by the, li- the, the author of life, will we not grow and flourish in our lives? It says that yield this fruit in its season. This means that those who are walking with God, who have roots down in this water, they grow. Um, and this is not some materialistic prosperity of the world, you know, like financial gain. Oh, if, I, if I'm close to God, I'm going to make a lot of money, or I'm going to have business success, or I'm going to live more comfortably, or I'll retire early. This is fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that we talk to you about every week when you walk in here, of the inner life, of your heart being changed, growing closer to God, wanting God more in your life, a deeper ability to love people, A willingness to sacrifice your own preferences and desires for the sake of others. A quickness to forgive that you didn't think that you had before. These are the types of fruit that he's speaking of here in this psalm. And then he goes on to say, whose leaf does not wither. The the leaves of this tree don't wither. Um, And this is a picture of how people who are planted by this water, by Jesus, so to speak, or in him, um, become more resilient and they, they're more long-suffering, which means that they're able to bear pain longer with people. They're less affected by their circumstances than others. They become less anxious in their life because they're rooted in Jesus himself. So there's this beautiful picture of what it looks like to be planted, to be rooted by the right thing. Now, this is the coolest part of the whole passage. Pointed out by Steve Green to me earlier in the week, okay? Is that the word here for planted where it says... Um, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water. The word is not planted, it is transplanted. So the, this is a picture of the gospel. That all of us lived life under the influence of those who did not know God. And we were, we were in a dry and barren place. Um, it's the good news. It means that God has taken us out of our self-absorbed, fruitless emptiness, and he replants us. And what does he plant us? What's the water? Water is always a symbol in the Bible for life. And it's found in Jesus. We are a tree planted by Jesus, in Jesus. He connects himself to us that we may live. This is why we can't just say, sure, I have God in my life, and then believe whatever we want. Only Jesus claims to rescue you and transplant you to a place where you'll flourish. In your life. This is a theme that we see in all kinds of places in the Bible. Psalm 1, what we see, the picture here in Psalm 1 of this tree. We also see it in Jeremiah chapter 7, Ezekiel 47, and at the end in Scripture in Revelation. But I want to read to you a passage from Jeremiah 17 that describes it. And just listen to the words that Jeremiah uses to talk about this. He says, this is what God says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man and who draws strength from flesh, and whose heart turns away from God. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. 
But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord and whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. There's the picture, right? Exactly what they're talking about in Psalm 1. This is what it looks like to live in Jesus, rooted in him. Last thing, there are two sure consequences for these types of way of living uh, that we see in verses 5 and 6. Uh, without God, it says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This psalm ends by telling the end of the story for these two ways of life. Both the disciples of God and the disciples of the world are headed the same place. They're headed for judgment. And this is an event, judgment, at the end of this world where both these groups of people will be judged based on the way that they lived. Right? Now the wicked, it says, will not stand in judgment as they realize what they've done. Now I want you to imagine this. You, you've realized what you've done. You've realized in the day of judgment that you have lived in a way uh, as if there is no God or that God is optional or that you're opposed to God and now you know there is one. Okay? And this means that as they hear the truth of how their life commitments bear out, that they will not be able to deal with themselves. They can't stand. They will be overcome with the choices that they've made. Their hearts will be undone with guilt and misery. Their living for self leads to their destruction, as it says in verse 6. And what they've refused to see in this world will be made clear to them in the next. Now, um, C.S. Lewis talks about how this begins to happen now. He describes hell and judgment as sort of beginning now in the way that we leave, live our lives in regards to discipleship. I want to read you a quote by him that I think is helpful. He says, Hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others. But you're still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can't do that anymore. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even to enjoy it, but just to be the grumble itself, going on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. You see what Lewis is saying? Like there are consequences for what we soak up. If we keep soaking it up, if we keep living lives that are distant, apart from God, that hell begins to grow in us. But with God, there's a whole different ballgame. The righteous, those who are right with God, have a different fate on this judgment day. They will not be overcome with guilt or shame or be destroyed. But not because of why we would naturally think. All right, this is important. This is the, maybe the most important thing I'll tell you today, okay? You see, we might think that righteous people are not guilty and have no shame or no sin, but we all do. They are exactly the same. Righteous people are exactly the same as unrighteous people, except for one thing. They are in Jesus. That's the difference. There is no difference between me or you or anyone else in this world except for Jesus being for us. We see it hinted in the passage. He says at the very end, I think in verse 6, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. This is the summary of the whole psalm. God watches over us. He's with us. He's in us. That's the picture of what Jesus has done for us. Um, it says in verse 1 that we are blessed or favored by him. This favor not, doesn't come by being moral, by doing the right thing or being a good person. It doesn't come by trying hard and earning your way to him or even by just loving people really well. The favor of God doesn't come through those things. The favor of God comes through Jesus and your trust and commitment and, and, and uh, faith in him. That is where it comes from. 
I want to end by telling you a little story from the New Testament. Uh, there's, a, there's a time in the New Testament where Jesus is with his disciples. And the, uh, the disciples come to him and they say, what must we do to do the will of God? Tell us what to do. And Jesus says this to them. To do the will of God, you must believe in the one whom he has sent. He doesn't tell them to go do things. He doesn't go tell them to preach and to heal people. He tells them to believe, to trust. And this is fascinating. The word believe can be translated relax. What do I do to do the will of God? Relax in the one whom he has sent. Rest in Jesus Christ. Trust in Jesus Christ. Know Jesus Christ. Be in Jesus Christ. Soak up Jesus Christ. That is the way to live. So I put the question to all of us today, will we relax in the good news today that Jesus is our King? May we help each other do this today and every day ahead. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we pray that we would live the right way. That we would live as though we are yours. That we would live the way of faith, trusting you, of living our life on your shoulders, of being carried along, Live a, a forgiven life, a, a healed life, a life of rest and joy and reconciliation. Would you help us, Lord Jesus, to believe? And we pray this in your name.